Good evening. We'll call to order the April 14th, 2022 meeting of the Brisbane Planning Commission. This virtual meeting is compliant with the Ralph M. Brown Act as amended by California Assembly Bill number 361, effective September 16, 2021, providing for a public health emergency exception to the standard teleconference rules required by the Brown Act. The purpose of this is to provide a safe environment for the public, staff, and planning commissioners while allowing for public participation. The Planning Commission meeting is being broadcast on Comcast Channel 27 and the city's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brisbaneca. The agenda materials may be viewed online at brisbaneca.org slash meetings. All written comments submitted before 2 p.m. of the day of the meeting have already been provided to the Commission and available for public inspection at the front lobby in City Hall and online at brisbaneca.org slash meetings. Any writings received after the agenda has been posted, but after 2 p.m. of the day of the meeting will be available online at the start of the meeting at brisbaneca.org slash meetings, at which time the materials will be distributed to the commission. For those who did not provide written comments, a call-in telephone number was provided on the agenda, which can be viewed online at brisbaneca.org slash meetings. The phone number and instructions will also be provided during the meeting. Participants in the Zoom webinar may make their comments through Zoom. Please note that Zoom participants will only be able to address the Commission verbally. I will announce time limits for public comment for the particular item as needed. Uh, Beth, may we have a roll call of the Commission, please? Commissioner Gooding. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Tell. Here. Commissioner Lau. Here. Commissioner Sison? Here. Let the record reflect Commissioner Funka is absent. Thank you. And uh, in, a, in a moment, I'll ask for a motion to adopt the agenda. However, I should inform uh, the public that uh, the agenda has been modified from that initially distributed uh, several days ago. Um, item G from new business uh, pertaining to uh, animals for biomedical research. Uh, at uh, at Sierra Point has been dropped from the agenda. The reason being that that um, that particular type of use permit is actually uh, to be uh, agendized for the City Council and not for the Planning Commission, and that will appear on the agenda of the City Council at a meeting to be determined in the, in the future. Um, therefore, with that uh, modified agenda, I would ask for a motion to adopt the agenda. I'll make a motion. And second. Second. Uh, staff, uh, roll call or voice vote, please. Commissioner Gooding. Aye. Commissioner Lau. Aye. And Commissioner Patel. Aye. Commissioner Sison. Aye. All right. Uh, the agenda is adopted then as modified. Uh, regarding the consent calendar, are there any members of the public or any commissioners who would like to pull any item from the consent calendar? Um, the staff will post a text and call number on the screen um, at this time. Any Zoom participants who want to pull an item from that calendar could raise their hand by pressing the raise hand button or by pressing star nine on their phone if they have called in. Staff will have a timer for 30 seconds for members of the public to ask to pull any item. Uh, while we're waiting for any comments from the public? Are there any commissioners who would like to remove any item from the consent calendar? There are none. 10 seconds. No members of the public have raised their hands. Good. May I please have a motion to adopt the consent calendar as presented? So moved. Any second? Second. Uh, staff, a voice vote, please. Commissioner Gooding? Aye. Commissioner Lau? Aye. Commissioner Patel? Aye. Commissioner Sison? Aye. Very good. The consent calendar is adopted with five eyes. Four eyes, excuse me. Um, oral communications. Um, any oral comments on items not on the agenda, not on the agenda, may be called in by calling the teleconference number in the next one minute or made by participants in the Zoom webinar. 
staff will display a call in number on the screen. And if any Zoom meeting participants um, wish to raise their hand to indicate to staff they would like to address the commission on items not on the agenda, I may do so at this time. And staff is running a timer for one minute. While that is running, um, the commission did receive uh, uh, a written communication. Uh, however, it was regarding item G, the um, animal biomedical research uh, vivarium issue, which has been removed from the agenda um, and will be presented before the city council in, in due course. And staff, are there any other written communications that, that I didn't see? No. Okay, thank you. 10 seconds. All right, no, no members of the public raise their hand. Very good, thank you. Um, moving on, there is no old business. Moving on to new business. The first item on that agenda is a public hearing on uh, sign program modification 2022 SR3, an amendment to SR-7-19 at 800 to 1800 Sierra Point Parkway. Um, staff, there are three sign program matters on the agenda. Does it make sense to discuss them uh, in bulk or, or one by one? And I'll leave it to, to your discretion for that. There are uh, two that are uh, related to each other, but they are separate requests. So we'll run through them separately so okay. that you can have your, have your action separately on each request. Okay. Uh, the second one of the two should be pretty brief since they are related. All right, off you go. <coughs> so, so staff, go ahead. Yeah, one moment, just bringing up the PowerPoint here. All right, thank you, Chair. As introduced, this agenda item is for a modification to the shore at Sierra Point sign program to enlarge the currently approved entry monument sign approved in 2019 under SR-7-19 at the southeast corner of Sierra Point Parkway and Marina Boulevard in the Sierra Point Commercial District. The shore at Sierra Point sign program only applies to the Health Peak Biotech R&D campus at 800 to 1800 Sierra Point Parkway. The Sierra Point sign program currently applies to every other parcel within the Sierra Point sub area. The applicant's request would revise the entry monument signage standard, incorporate a dark blue backdrop to increase the overall size of the sign. No other changes are proposed to the shore at Sierra Point sign program. The current entry monument was installed earlier this year, as seen in the photo on the lower right. The, um, the approved size is seven foot, eight inches tall and 22 feet long or 169 square feet. and is composed of sculptural fabricated freestanding and eternally illuminated letter forms mounted atop an aluminum base that reads the shore. Dimensional non-illuminated letters that read at Sierra Point in lowercase type and a rectangular recess are located on the sign's aluminum base. Both are painted blue and Health Peak's logo is also located on the sign's base. After installation, the property owner determined the freestanding letters were not legible without a contrasting backdrop. As a result, the owners are requesting planning commission approval to add a backdrop and enlarge the shore entry monument sign, and at the same time, enlarge the tower's entry monument sign at the opposite corner under a separate request addressed in a separate report. So both entry monument signs will be identical in size and appearance. The applicant's request, shown here, would revise the entry monument signage standards in the shore at Sierra Point sign program to incorporate a dark blue backdrop and increase the sign size to 8 feet 5 inches tall and 24 feet long, or 202 square feet. The color palette and location remain unchanged, and aside from the new dark blue backdrop and enlarged overall size, the only other change to the entry monument sign is the relocation of the Health Peak logo from the sign's base to the top left corner of the new backdrop. Here's a comparison of the currently approved and proposed modifications to the entry monument sign. See the signs in the lower right of the slide for the shore. 
This slide also shows proposed changes to the tower's entry monument sign for reference and a photo simulation of what the entrance to the Sierra Point sub area would look as currently approved, the top photo, and as proposed with the modifications, the image second from the top. You can see that both the shore and the tower entry signs utilize the same internally illuminated letter forms mounted to an aluminum base, but the proposed modification under the applicant's two requests would make the entry signs identical in size and appearance. To grant the modification, the Planning Commission must make certain findings prescribed under Brisbane Municipal Code Section 17.36.060. They are summarized on this slide. The sign must comply with all applicable city ordinances. The sign must not conflict with building scale, colors, materials, or architectural details and styles found at Sierra Point. And since the sign is illuminated, the sign does not produce a glare or present a distraction or hazard to others or otherwise cause a public nuisance. With respects to this request and detailed within the agenda report, the sign program modifications will comply with all applicable city ordinances. This request has been reviewed by North County Fire Authority, Public Works, the Building Department, Regional Water Quality Control Board, and San Mateo County Health. No concerns were raised. A building permit will be required to modify the sign. And since the site is located on a closed landfill, the County Health Department will review the building permit application for compliance with Title 27 as part of the building permit application. The modern design, color scheme, and location remains the same as approved in 2019 under SR-7-19, where the commission found the entry monument sign fits well with buildings and grounds in terms of style, scale, colors, and materials. The proposed modification will provide a cohesive and formal entrance to the Sierra Point sub area and complement the proposed alteration to the entry monument sign at 1000 Sierra Point under 2022-SR-2. And the modification is not anticipated to affect glare or present a distraction as there is no change to the existing illumination of the sign. An existing performance standards part of the sign program and Brisbane Municipal Code require signs to be properly maintained in a state of good repair. This concludes staff presentation with a recommendation of approval of 2022-SR-3 by adoption of the attached resolution. Any questions at this time? If any commissioners have any questions, uh, Commissioner Lau, any questions? No question. Commissioner Patel, any questions? I have no questions. Commissioner Sayasan, any questions? None. Okay. I have none either. Um, this time, therefore, we can uh, open the public hearing this time to see and ask the applicant if they would like to speak to this uh, item. Is the applicant present? Let me promote the applicant and then I'll, I'll bring up the, the um, recall it. All right, Chris, you should be able to turn on your camera and address the commission. Hey guys, thank you so much. Um, I really have nothing else to say. Thank you, Jeremiah, for a nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll open the hearing to the public. Um, the chair, I have a quick question for the applicant. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, you say that the sign has a dimmer to allow for illumination of, you know, the, the levels to be adjusted. Um, I was wondering, could that be put on a timer so that during um, non-business hours or when we're all asleep that we could reduce um, the energy that's, you know, required to uh, illuminate the sign? I feel like that shouldn't be a problem. Um, I would, of course, need to run it by the client, by healthy. But um, if that was something that the commission wanted to see, I think that's certainly something that we could at least explore. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we do have uh, one member of the public with their hand raised. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Michelle. Yes, this is Michelle Salmon. I think that the size increase is overstated. I do not think that, I don't mind the blue background of, of, around the letters, but increasing the size to over eight feet tall and 24 feet long is huge. That is huge. 
and I don't I think that it will not fit I do not think you should allow signs that are that large and overbearing and also we're working on a dark skies ordinance and um, I think that the the sign will not, not be compliant with the what we're hoping to have passed in the dark skies ordinance I think it needs to be able to be dimmed after a certain uh, time at night and um, not stay on all night long like so I really object to the size that's just unless you don't decide 24 feet long when it's right on the right on the street no that's ridiculous uh, I think it should stay the size, same size it is and just uh in, you know put the blue background that you want to increase the visibility of uh, the tower and the whatever the one said but eight eight over eight feet tall by 24 feet wide that's huge that's a huge if you go back to that diagram you can see what an increase in size that represents and i think that's way out of proportion to everything else and it, it's just it just it doesn't doesn't thank you thank you any other um, public comments raising here there are not and two minutes has passed very good thank you um We have no written communications regarding this matter, obviously. Um, are there any, let's open the floor then to any comments or, or um, opinions by commissioners and any comments? I, I had one question I have staff. This is an, in, a, an increase in size from, from what size to what size? As I recall, it was already seven feet something, wasn't it? That's correct. It's. Uh... 22 feet long and I think seven feet five inches tall. I can double check for you. This is an increase of one foot in one dimension and something under two feet in the other. Seven foot eight and 22 feet long. Yes. Currently. Right. If you like, I can bring the comparison slide That's back up. Seven inches and seven inches taller and two feet. Two feet longer. Longer. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other comments by the commission? The the dimming um, function, uh, I would um, uh, agree with the commissioner size on the you know um, just you know if the if the applicant could you know make that happen or. Mm -hmm. at least look into it you know i think uh yeah, I, I would i would encourage that as well I'll, i think you know to the to miss salmon's point of if we do enact a dark skies ordinance then obviously these will be mm -hmm. subject to that as well and, and any requirements of that ordinance will apply to this sign um at which time they they will be be compelled to, to make adjustments whether they they do so at this time voluntarily or not um I think at this point we don't have any jurisdiction under the municipal code to to require uh, to require dimming. We can encourage it and um, do that strongly, but uh, it's not in the code to enforce it this time. Um, well, I mean, you could put it into the condition of approval, right? You can say we can we're only going to approve it if there's a dimming function on the light, so that if there is a dark skies ordinance, then people would be able to dim it. A fair point. Yeah. Um, I apologize. I've forgotten the first name. Oh, Chris, is yeah. there is, okay. is there a, is there a dimming function on the sign? There is a dimming function. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. And absolutely, it, it is simple enough for us to look into this. Um, and like I think Commissioner Patel had mentioned, if this is conditioned that it needs to be dimmable, I don't see that as a problem uh, from the larger applicant team. It is currently dimmable already. Is that correct? It is. It is currently dimmable. I believe. I think it feels to me like everything um, external illumination needs to be dimmable. It just seems to be very common on projects. So I would imagine this would. It's a non-issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. through, through the chair, the the current sign program uh, has a, I believe, a performance standard that includes a dimmable switch. If not, it was included in the, the building permit application. Yeah. It's fairly yeah. common at all what we apply to all illuminated signs in Brisbane. Very good. 
Thank you. All right. In that case, um, may I have a motion for this particular oh, hold item? On one second. One oh, second. Sorry. Uh, um, Mr. Um, Mateo, if you could possibly explain why you want the sign to be that big versus something a little bit smaller. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what happened was that um, Health Peak was satisfied with current um, approved designs for both the shore and the, and the tower side until they drove past the shore side, which is now installed. And they were unhappy with the effect of the letters against kind of the sky in the backdrop. And so um, what felt like the most appropriate response was to leave the sign as is and then build an aluminum cabinet behind it. So that's the additional two feet that you're seeing is really um, that width increase because of the additional aluminum cabinet and also the delta of eight inches at the top. So it's everything is the same. It's the installation of a blue cabinet behind the existing sign. Thank you. Any other, any other comments or questions to the applicant? And through the chair, we do need to close the public hearing. Thank you. Um, you have a motion then, please, to close the public hearing. I'll make a motion. In a second. Second. Okay. Uh, voice vote, please. Commissioner Gooding. Aye. Commissioner Lau. You are muted, Commissioner Lau. Aye. Right. Apologize. Aye. Right. Commissioner Patel. Aye. Commissioner Sison. Aye. All right. With, with four eyes, the public hearing is closed. Um, may I have a, a, a motion then regarding this item? If, if not, I will, I will move to adopt this item um, pursuant to the staff recommendations with the findings contained therein. Any seconds? I'll second. Oh, voice vote. Can please. you guys wait? Do you guys want to add the modification, the dimming? The dimming's uh, already there, right? Right. Did you want to add that they're going to look into making it both automatic? Oh, it just seems like it'd, it'd be easier, right? So that someone doesn't have to do it every night and you know dim it down. Right. So I think what he, what Mr. Mateo was saying is, if it's part of the conditions of our approval, then mm -hmm. they would. Right. Yeah. So you guys, yeah. yeah. I mean, yes. If it's if it's a simple thing, which I you you suggested that it would be simple to do to put a timer on on it, then let's put that in the condition, make it easier. Do we agree? Agree. We can make that amendment. Okay. Okay. With, with that motion as as amended, do we have a second? Second. A voice vote, please. Commissioner Gooding. Aye. Commissioner Lau. Aye. Commissioner Patel. Aye. Commissioner Sison. Aye. Okay. The motion carries, and the item is is uh, adopted as amended. Uh, anyone may appeal the action of the Planning Commission to the City Council, except where otherwise specified. Appeals shall be filed with the City Clerk not later than 15 calendar days following the Planning Commission's decision. Exceptions to the 15-day filing period include the following. Appeals shall be filed with the City Clerk within six calendar days of the Planning Commission's action for use permits and variances and 10 calendar days for tentative maps and advertising sign applications. An application form and fee is required to make a formal appeal. For additional information, please contact the City Clerk at 415-508-2110. All right, moving on, <coughs> excuse me. The next item on the agenda, item E, uh, sign program modification 2022-SR-2. Um, staff report, please. Thank you, Chair. This agenda item is for a modification to the Sierra Point sign program to enlarge the currently approved entry monument sign approved in 2021 under sign program amendment SR-3-21 
at the northeast corner of Sierra Point Parkway and Marina Boulevard in the Sierra Point Commercial District. The Sierra Point sign program currently applies to every parcel within Sierra Point Sudbury, excluding the Health Peak Biotech R&D campus at 800 to 1800 Sierra Point Parkway. The applicant's request would revise the entry monument signage standards. No other changes are proposed to the Sierra Point sign program under this request. And as I said before, this request is being made in conjunction with the previously heard item to enlarge the entry monument sign for both the shore and the towers. All right, uh, commissioners, any, any questions of staff regarding this item? Commissioner Powell. And um, no. Commissioner Patel. No, I have no questions, sorry. Commissioner Sayasan. None. I have no questions either. Um, will we open the public hearing to the applicant and then the public, please. Do we have Chris still in the meeting? Yeah, Chris is there. He, he can address if. Hey, Chris, do you I'm have so sorry. I'm so sorry, guys. I thought you wanted public first. Um, no additional comment, I don't think, for me. Thank you again, Jeremiah and Cher. All right. Let's open the public hearing then, please. So we have Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Go ahead. Hi. I hope that you apply the same uh, caveat about the dimming on this one that you did on the one that you just approved. I still object to the size. I think the whole place is just going to be a bevy of signs, but at least have it um, uh, automatically dimmable. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, members of the public in the in the room right now? So far, no. Uh, we have about a minute and a half to. Right. Thank you. And through the chair, the performance standards of the chair point. Uh, sign program does include the installation of a dimmer, but you would have to add the automatic feature as a condition of approval if you wish to apply that. Thirty seconds. Ten seconds. All right, there are no other members of the public wishing to comment. Thank you. May I have a motion to close the public hearing, please? I just have a, oh, I'm, I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Any seconds? Second. Second. Voice vote, please. Commissioner Goody? Aye. Commissioner Lau? Aye. Commissioner Patel? Aye. Commissioner Saison? Aye. Okay, public hearing is closed. Um, any further comments by commissioners, please? Um, I have a question for Jeremiah. Um, in attachment A, page 24, where it says um, it is approved under conditions of approval attached herein as Exhibit A, such as such amendments being described in Exhibit B, um, or are we incorporating into this um, attachment A, Exhibit B? Is that the same as Exhibit B? Exhibit B is the, the actual um, change to the, uh, the sign program. So at attachment A is the, the resolution with the findings and conditions of approval. And then exhibit B is the excerpt from the actual sign program. Show uh, the language in there. 
So when we're doing these approvals, for example, like attachment A exhibit B, which is is that is is where you sort of put in the um, agenda the you know the stuff that you presented that's going to be that we're voting on. Is that incorporated into our is that incorporated into our um, approval? It's, of it's the part resolution. Of the, yeah, it's part of the it's it's in the language of the approved resolution because it's referencing the findings of conditions of approval exhibit a and then it also also references the uh the graphics package under exhibit b the approving mechanism is the resolution and there are those two exhibits to the resolution they're all part of the action and the approval okay so are they incorporated in reference into our approval are they are those standards incorporated into what we're approving. So for example, we're approving a sign that's let's say eight feet, eight and a half feet, right? The, the resolution doesn't specifically say that the sign's gonna be eight and a half feet. We're just saying we're making a modification so that there could be a change in sign. It would be my assumption that because the presentation says it's gonna be eight and a half feet, that it's gonna be eight and a half feet. Is there anything that incorporates that understanding of what was presented into the resolution? Yes, the, the very last clause, um, it says it's um, amending the short zero point sign program approved previously under SR 7-19 is approved per conditions of approval attached herein, exhibit A, such amendments being described in exhibit B. And exhibit B okay. has the, the size um, and the, any, any other details of the sign. So when it says on page 28, Attachment A, Exhibit B, that's the exhibit that you're incorporating into our approval. Yes. Okay, thank you. That was my question. Thank you. Any other um, comments or questions from the commissioner? Yeah. All right. Um, may I have a motion, please, uh, on this item? I'll make a motion. Um, to um, adopt the staff recommendation via resolution 2022-SR3 with the condition that there's an automatic timer or automatic dimmer, um, sorry, an automatic timer attached to the dimmer on these signs as well. Any second? Second that motion. A voice vote, please. Commissioner Gooding? Aye. Commissioner Lau? Aye. Commissioner Patel? Aye. Commissioner Sison? Aye. All right. Uh, sign program modification 2022-SR2 is adopted um, with the staff, rec uh, staff findings and um, the modification contained in the motion. Um, moving on then to item F. The sign program 2021-SR-9 regarding 1,000 and 3,000 to 3,500 Marina Boulevard. Uh, staff report, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, I think I might have just muted you. Uh, good evening, Commission. Um, so the request before you tonight um, is for sign program approval. This would apply to properties at 1,000 and 3,000 to 3,500 Marina Boulevard. Um, these properties are owned by the same um, developer, uh, industrial developer, phase three real estate. Uh, as you know, 3,000 to 3,500 Marina is currently under construction as a three uh, building life sciences campus, uh, while 1,000 Marina is developed with one uh, building of office and life science uses. So the sign program would create a cohesive um, campus branded sign program, including um, campus site and building identification signs, wall mounted tenant identification signs, and then uh, accessory signs for wayfinding direction, uh, directional signage and interior circulation, as well as signage for the amenities um, that they have at the 3000 to 3500 Marina location. They are also installing flags with uh, property owner branded flags, which qualifies as a sign under our program. So that's included there as well. 
Uh, here's a map of the sites. Um, so uh, the applicant will go over in more detail in her presentation the location of the campus uh, sign, but generally there will be some new signage at that primary Sierra Point Parkway and Marina Boulevard intersection. So right across um, from the two signs you previously were discussing tonight at the north west corner of that intersection is where the campus branding signage will go or excuse me the campus identification sign so the sign program establishes fairly um, uh, strict standards for the majority of signs um, there's not a, a lot of variation anticipated for um, the campus identification signs and other site monument signs and wayfinding uh, where there's more flexibility built into the program is the regulations on tenant uh, wall signage. So um, they aren't leased out yet. Um, so a lot of this is broad parameters. So max maximum number and location of signs mounted on the building, um, as well as materials. But it leaves the colors um, and kind of the more fine grain details uh, to be determined by future tenants. Uh, so that's kind of a two pronged approach in this that's that, in this sign program that's very similar to what was done at the shore. So basically, again, setting kind of maximum thresholds and then having um, the forthcoming sign design be a little more customizable for future tenants. Um, so with that in mind, um, the sign program uh, regulations call primarily for building permit approval. So a sign um, other than for tenant wall signs or any significant modifications. So um, sign approval for the monument signs and other, um, other interior signage would be building permit review only. Um, any modifications to those signs and then any tenant wall signs would be subject to community development director review under a sign review permit. And um, the community development director may uh, may choose to refer items up to uh, the zoning administrator and potentially would then be appealable to the commission. Um, and then, of course, any amendments to the sign program would be considered by the planning commission. Those would be increases in the number of signs, any significant uh, changes to the parameters established in the sign program. So in general, um, and again, the applicant's going to go over a little bit of the design um, in detail. She has some exhibits for you all to, to review. But in general, um, the sign program is a cohesive collection of branded signage. So the intent, again, is to this Genesis Marina uh, campus is to make it all standardized. Um, the material palette is um, internally consistent. It echoes the materials found on both properties. We're talking glass and concrete and metal. Um, so all of those elements are echoed. In Post sign program. Um, the wall, wall visions of the flexibility um, in this wall uh, limited. Finally, so with that, uh, we're recommending conditional approval uh, via adoption of the resolution and all pertinent exhibits. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are at this point. Uh, before we open the public hearing, uh, any commissioner have any questions of staff at this point? I was going to ask, what is a significant deviation? So that would be, it's there's some definition, a discussion in the sign program, what that would mean. Um, but are you meaning what would trigger a sign program modification versus a sign review application? Right. You said that there could be modifications of except for the, unless they're significant, which, which point they'd have to come back to the Planning Commission. So I just wanted to know what significant meant. Sure. So I'll break it down a little differently. So for signs that are submitted um, that are consistent with the standards in the sign program for 
location, dimension, materials, uh, uh, consistent with whatever standards is established for that particular sign. Um, all, any sign other than the tenant pole signs is subject to just building permit approval. But if, for example, a sign that otherwise would have been exempt or would be subject to a building permit, they came in and it was doubled in size or it was completely different material. Um, that I would I would consider that a significant uh, modification that where we'd probably say, well, this is really just truly inconsistent with your program. Um, I think ultimately the community development director has the discretion to make a determination. I think if it's a matter of, you know, um, a slightly different material, uh, but it still has the same high quality um, and still has the same function, I wouldn't consider that necessarily a significant modification. Um, a sign program, a very clear and obvious trigger for modifications to the sign program uh, from staff's perspective would be again altering the number of signs, significantly changing um, the maximum sign areas. Uh, so I, I think there are some parameters built into the sign program itself in terms of a definition. Um, I think there's always going to be a little bit of discretion and interpretation, but um, does that help explain a little bit? Yeah, I was just wondering if there's like objective standards, like for example, if it goes over a foot or some, or if it's, you know, uh, if it is a, if it's a different material, then it's automatically triggers it, but it seems like it's more subjective. Yeah, I, I, it, it, there is nothing at granular that says, you know, if it's eight inches, then it's okay. If it's nine inches, then it's not. Um, but I, I mean, I would just say in general, the maximum dimensions in the sign program for most signs, they are maximums. So um, that, that's a pretty clear line um, of, you know, here is, here's the sign dimensions, that's a maximum dimension. Here is the area of the sign in which you may have addressing or tenant signs. There's a maximum area that's contained in. So um, I think that it sets pretty clear um, thresholds for most aspects of the sign designs. Any other questions from any other commissioners of staff? No. I had a, a general question, if it's possible to summarize it this way. Are we essentially being asked to adopt a, a signage program that is in some way comparable or, or similar to that applicable to the other ex existing projects? Or are they, are they materially different in some ways? Procedurally, the, this sign program is most similar to the one you adopted for the show, um, just in terms of the regulatory schema. Um, when it comes to like to the design aspect, um, and, and or in terms of like sign area and that sort of thing, um, the types of signs are very similar to again what we see at the shore. And most sites have a site entry monument ID. Um, I think the um, there is some difference in this sign program in terms of tenant signage. I think the shore has a lot more, well, it's a lot more building area, as you know. There's also a lot more tenants. So I know that there's, I think, more tenant signage um, in, in, you know, this sign program has less tenant signage overall, although the sign, pro, sign area per sign is a bit larger. So it's, they're all fairly similar in that they want to orient people to a fairly large campus. So they're trying to direct pedestrians and vehicles and tenants want to have advertising signage. Um, every program's a little bit different when it comes to where that signage is located and, and the maximum areas they establish. In terms, for example, the, the, the monument signage at the, beginning or entrance to the campus. How does that, how does this sign ordinance compare in sizing to that of the, the ones across the street? That campus, uh, the campus identification sign is similar in scale to, um, to both the shore and uh, towers uh, monument sign. So the dimension of the campus sign, um, let's see if I can bring it up. I, I think the applicant will go over that in her presentation as well. Oops. Um, 
but the dimensions of the campus sign are, it's just under eight feet tall, and I think it's about 24 feet wide, and uh, I don't have it pulled up immediately. So um, hopefully uh, Casey Bills, the applicant, can highlight that in her presentation for you all. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no other questions then, why don't we go ahead and open up the public hearing and begin with the applicant. Okay, I'm going to promote Casey Bills. And um, Casey, once you're in, you should be able to unmute yourself and share your screen. Hello, good evening. Hi, thank you. go ahead. Thank you for having me. Hi, thank you, Julia, for giving the introduction of the project. I'm going to share my presentation. Great. Um, as Julia already went over, this is for the 3,000 through 3,500 marina project and three life buildings, as well as the 1,000 marina project, which is a six story office building. And these properties are adjacent to one another in the Sierra Point area. So, starting with the site building identification, we have a campus monument sign located at Marina Boulevard and uh, Sierra Point Parkway. And this would be a seven by seven foot by seven inches high by 25 foot wide monolith of polished precast concrete. And the campus identity would be located on the south face of the sign. The graphic area is not to exceed five foot five by 22 feet five inches wide on the south face of the monument. And the letter forms are to be brushed stainless steel with internal halo illumination. This is a plan view showing the setback from the property line. And then these are two site monuments at the entries to each site. Uh, the, both of them are to be four foot by six inches high and 15 foot wide. Also the polished precast concrete. Uh, the campus identity and the address numerals would be on both sides of the sign. And the graphics are not to exceed the two foot 10 by 13 foot four inches wide on either face of the monument. And again, these would be brushed stainless steel with internal halo illumination. This is showing it in plan view, seeing where it's set back in the landscape median relative to the street. And then at 1000 Marina, we are proposing that we replace the existing monument sign. And it would have the same dimensions and um, same area not to exceed as the one I, I just show, had shown you. And this is, a plan showing its location set back in the landscape relative to the road. And then we also have a secondary site monument sign here. And this is at the 3,3500 Marina Boulevard site. It's located at the base of the podium stairs at the ground level. And it would be one foot six by 12 foot wide. And again, polished precast concrete. And the graphic area is not to be the 10 inches by 9 foot 11. Um, and also brush stainless steel with internal halo illumination. We have four building addresses, and these would be both visible from a distance and at the pedestrian level. At the 3000 through 3500 Marina Boulevard, the building address rolls to be pin mounted above each building entry at the top of each entry wicket, and no illumination is proposed at these locations. At the 1000 Marina Boulevard, the building address numerals are to be mounted at the pedestrian level above an existing concrete wall, and the numerals will be backlit by LED lighting. Um, all numerals for these building addresses are proposed to be brushed stainless steel, fabricated letter forms measuring one foot six inches in cap height. And we'll move on to wayfinding signage. Uh, there are four vehicular directional signs proposed for the campus. These are six foot high by two foot wide plinths of polished precast concrete with a cleat mounted brush stainless steel panel. And the graphics on the stainless steel panel are to be etched and filled with dark gray. And we have six pedestrian directional signs proposed for the campus. Uh, they're very similar in construction to the vehicular signs, but these are six foot high by one foot six inches wide. Now moving on to identification signs, 
We have a total of three garage entry signs proposed for the campus. And these are dark gray precision cut vinyl that's applied to the surface of the metal panels. And then we have three delivery loading dock ID signs. And these would be three eighths inch thick stainless steel plaque with etched and filled graphics. And these are applied to the concrete walls with pin mounts and silicone. Moving on to the amenity signs, we have uh, four amenity signs proposed for the campus. And these would be water jet cut stainless steel letter forms with horizontal brush finish. And these would be surface applied to the, the glass above the, the entry doors. And the amenity branding should not exceed the one foot 8.5 inches high by four foot 10 inches wide on the transom. At the fitness center, there are three proposed signs. One is a vinyl identification and then two plaques on the side of the entry wicket on the outer walls. And those plaques would be water jet cut the circular stainless steel plaque with etched and filled graphic. And we are proposing that these would not exceed one foot seven by one foot seven wide. Then on to tenant signs. There are a total of eight tenant skyline signs proposed across the four buildings. Uh, starting with looking at the approach along the 101 freeway heading south, uh, this shows proposed building, uh, the elevation and the proposed location and size for the 3000 building and the 3500 building. And then this is the existing 1000 Marina Boulevard Mammoth Biosciences building up there today, or sign that's there today. So this is the view of that approach kind of seeing the Mammoth Bioscience building off here. Um, I should note that this InfoBio logo is just a placeholder. Um, as Julia mentioned, these have not been fully leased, um, so we've provided guidelines for future tenants. And then this is along the uh, going north on 101 and seeing the 3000 building and then the existing Mammoth Biosciences sign as well and the view from, from that vantage point. And then going to Marina Boulevard, there are three skyline signs that are visible. Uh, this is looking at 3,000 and 3,500 building elevations, and this is building 3,300. And so this view shows if you're set back a bit further, what would be visible. And then as you approach onto the campus going towards the stair, you would see the sign at 3,300. Um, so the skyline tenant ID signs are proposed to be facelit channel letters internally illuminated with LEDs and that the logos would be in the tenant brand colors. So the allotted area is 47 feet, six inches wide by six feet high. And then lastly, looking at the tenant flag at 3000 through 3500 Marina site. Uh, three flags are proposed, one being the United States flag, one the California flag, and then the third uh, owner slash tenant flag. And we are proposing this would only be five foot by three feet, and that it should either have a solid dark background with light imagery or text, or a solid light background with dark imagery or text. And that the graphics within would only be within the allowable area of four foot seven by two foot seven. And that is the sign program. Hey, thank you. Um, any commissioner have any questions of the applicant before we uh, open to the rest of the public? No. Um, just one quick question as to the the um, I guess the, the entrance way or monument signage. Um, similar to the I don't know if you were around for the previous presentations. Are, are those dimmable or or switch offable? Uh, I think a, a dimmer is a totally. We're totally capable of adding that. Um, that's, that's fine, and it can be on a timer as well. On a note, as a performance standard, all illuminated signs must be dimmable. So that's already baked into the sign program. So the requirement for a timer would be an additional requirement should you want to impose that. I guess to the points earlier made by, by the public, if if in the event of a, a dark sky ordinance, then that timing would kick into, into effect requiring um, dimming on a certain schedule, right? Is that how it works? You have the ability to impose a condition now 
Right, right. But, but um, if yes, any future... future signs would be subject to a future dark sky ordinance. We don't know what those provisions would be, but yes, right. they, they have to be followed. By requiring a, a timer at this point, we, we kind of bake in. Allow we, for. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions from uh, by commissioners of the applicant before we open it up? It's going twice. Okay, let's open the public hearing then, please. Any members of the public? We do. We have Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Go ahead. Sorry, the little unmute button doesn't come up as fast as uh, as you say <laughs> go. Um, I have three things. One, I would like uh, signs to be dimmed after 10 p.m. Uh, regardless of what whether you know the dark skies ordinance goes through or not but um in researching that it just becomes more and more clear how important having a dark night sky is not just for people and for pleasure but for migration of animals and insects and uh, a whole host of things um that's one issue the second issue is on the monument sign that's uh when you first come in how close is that to the street is that going to block view of traffic um the one at the entrance and exit uh, you showed a brief uh by the way your presentation on the signage was really excellent um and you showed a brief uh picture of how close that was to the street i'm concerned about uh visibility traffic visibility if it's too close to the street people might not be able to see a car coming around the corner or pedestrians in that intersection and my third question is um, when you talked about tenant brand colors, um, what if the tenant's logo is red or some really bright color? We didn't allow Bank of America to have a red, red uh, illuminated sign. And I would hate to see it looking like, you know, um, I would hate to see it looking like that. So I, I'm wondering if you, uh, if there's any way to mitigate what brand colors would be allowed i know that's a little tough but you know the lower tone lower toned colors rather than like bright red bright yellow bright green chartreuse etc did you get all of those those are questions i have yeah through the chair um staff will address uh some of those okay. first, but um, but Casey, if you wouldn't mind, since you had the the diagram of the um, of the campus sure. monument sign, sure. Jeremiah, would it be okay for her to share? Okay. Um, but so generally, and this was addressed in the staff report. Um, it's also included in the sign program text. Um, thank you, Casey. So this is the presently proposed location of the campus sign. So um, Casey, it's. This, the dimension is about four feet from the property line um, at the easterly kind of portion, and then almost uh, narrowing down to almost three feet, um, I guess more towards the west. Um, so, but, but you'll notice the condition of approval or the description in the sign program addresses the fact that the location of the sign is subject to final approval by the city engineer. Um, it's going to depend on you know, any potential infrastructure, sorry, intersection improvements to this intersection. That could be pedestrian walkways, um, if there's anything going on actually to the roadway, um, as well as um, at 1000 Marina, there are some plant bay trail improvements. So the sign program bakes in, uh, you know, considerations for, you know, not conflicting with pedestrian improvements and with street improvements, as well as site distance. And, um, and defers the final location approval to the city engineer. Um, he did review the sign program, the city engineer, um, and he actually did the locations of the um, site monument signs on Marina Boulevard, the 1,000 and 3,000 like address signs. He mm -hmm. actually asked the applicant to adjust those for site distance reasons. So the city engineer has already looked at this. Including um, the one at 1,000 Marina, that's the one that was of concern. Correct. Well, no, you're talking about the was the campus sign. Well, I was concerned about at the, the corner. one that's, that's at 1000 Marina. This one here. Yeah. 
yes, uh, that's actually the sign that the CNG that specific case if you want to address a little bit more. But um, yeah, sure. Yeah, we went. Um, we addressed this over a period of time with the city engineer and uh, decided that it should be moved back. And we have a lot of measurements here showing it. Um, I also have sort of an analysis. You go to that for. This was an analysis he requested that if there's visibility from 200 feet back from a car and you know would this sign impede that and it was shown that it would not impede the visibility okay thank you um regarding limiting the colors um that is something that well for example the sierra point sign program has a very strict limit on on colors uh for signage that's resulted in this the planning commission having to review a lot of sign review applications and, and approving variances to the sign program for those so yes it's within your purview in a sign program to establish allowable color palette um the applicant has requested flexibility um but you know should you want to limit that you can that's within your power so does the sign program for the other properties that you just listed um what does that look like in terms of the the, the, the parameters? Um, I I would defer to Ken on the shore. I think for the Sierra Point sign program, the palette is really limited to I think gray, blue, and green. Um, we can pull that up for you though. Let me. Uh, or actually, Jeremiah, do you you looked at that sign program this evening? Do, do you recall? Is it? Um, I can pull it up. I just it'll take me a minute. So if anyone else knows while I'm doing that, no, I don't have that. Okay. And I don't. I don't think the shore had limited the the uh, tenant signs to certain colors. I, I just, I guess, comment on that. That generally speaking, these are trademark colors that that tenants have, and I think the city has. Uh, limitations in terms of uh, disqualifying trademark signs so I, i'd step cautiously there yeah just just to elaborate on that there is case law that the city is if you have a registered trademark the city cannot make um, somebody alter their their registered trademark and so you know colors are trademarked and designs are trademarked you know, the choices they have no sign or they, you know, we can't make them change the color of the sign if it is a registered mark. That's so the choice is no sign or if the color is not compliant or, or they get a variance, like what happened with Bank of America where they ended up with no sign. I'm not sure what the question was. I'm just reiterating that we disallowed having a red sign even though that was bank of america's new trademark colors at the entrance to brisbane and so i'm concerned about you know some uh, biotech that might have a a sign that's you know bright red on the side of the field, uh the huge monument signs at the top i'm concerned about that. hopefully not it won't happen Okay. Um, and then there was the question of having all the signs dim at, at 10. Right, right, right. Um, okay. Thank, thank you, you Rochelle. We'll, 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 thank you. We'll, we'll talk about this more when we get to the round table and the commissioners. Any other uh, public comments this time? Yes, we have Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my unmute button today, too. Um, just want to um, maybe point out for your benefit and perhaps the applicant's benefit that if the dark skies ordinance goes through, um, there are limits in that on the background colors of signs. Um, if they are internally illuminated, I didn't think any of these were internally illuminated, um, but I was only sort of half paying attention here. They are. Okay. So yeah, I, I mean, you might want to consider that or take a look at that because you don't want to have to completely immediately redo a sign that you've just installed. Um, so just just a heads up on that one. 
Okay, thank you. Any other public comments, uh, Jeremiah? Or uh, pardon me, Julia? Whoever's monitoring. There are no others. Um, I'm gonna put the slide back up. We have about 15 seconds more. Okay. How about the last call? All right, no one else, raise your hand. All right, may I have a motion please to close the public hearing? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Second. Uh, voice vote please, Seth. Commissioner Gooding. Aye. Commissioner Lau. Aye. Commissioner Patel. Aye. Commissioner Saison. Aye. Motion carries, public hearing is closed. Um, commissioners, any Further comments or questions or musings? I had a question about the dark, is possible the dark skies um, ordinance. Um, is that where the light is like shielded to emit, you know, light downwards or almost a complete, um, you know, uh, dimming of the light? And, you know, I'm all for, uh, I'm, and does that pose any potential like security concerns? You know, if it's too low, you know, light in certain areas, you know, around the around the campus. I think you're raising a lot of really good questions, and the fact is, this ordinance is, as I understand it, in a preliminary form, so sort of hard to develop regulations now based on an ordinance that's preliminary. So. Um, I would suggest that when that ordinance is further along, it'll be subject to commission review. And again, what the implications are on security and other sort of considerations could be taken into account at that point. It's just hard for us to sort of, or for anybody to regulate these signs today based on a forthcoming future ordinance that hasn't been publicly drafted yet or approved. So. But it's good information, and I think it's important. But you know, we do not have the, uh, the precise details of what the final uh, draft might look like. So we can suggest dimming to a certain point, but you know, still needs to be lit for safety and security. Mean. I, I, I guess there's, I guess there's, <laughs> there's, there's probably a difference between between these commercial signage issues and and you know perimeter lighting or pedestrian lighting or area lighting for security I, I think those are probably two different animals I suspect um I don't know how the dark skies ordinance would affect either one of those but, but I think they're different animals I think we're dealing here today in this um resolution not with uh, pedestrian or safety or parking lot but just rather with the commercial signage um if I'm not mistaken um any other questions or comment? Sandip or Kamala? Well, um, so did we want to put um, a time to when the automatic um, dimmer would go on? Because we didn't we didn't put that requirement in the first um, application. I know, I know. I, th I think what we've done in the the first two is is simply have a requirement that it, that it have a timer installation. I kind of am reluctant to, to to step on the dark skies people as to what that seek or what that um, schedule is going to be. It seems like I mean, that it could it could be something like when it's dark outside, they have to dim their lights, which could be six o'clock or five o'clock or some other time besides ten o'clock. Absolutely, I, I just think that that's kind of what the dark skies ordinance is 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 going to deal with, and I. I Seems like we're inventing a whole different wheel when they're already working on a wheel um, about that. But that's my that's just my take as, as one of one of four or five folks. Um, I, I'd rather that that the dark skies ordinance be talked about for all of the commercial buildings in whatever area of Brisbane they're talking about, rather than us trying to 
trying to piecemeal out, you know, this building or that building or that building. Um, I just don't think that's a necessary part of this resolution at this point, but that's just my take. Um, I think it's a it's a worthy thing, you know, to, to to talk about, and it sounds like there's folks working on it on a kind of a, uh, if not global, at least as citywide basis. Um, so, but I think it's worthwhile putting in the current resolution to modify that it that these have timers, uh, you know, baked in or wired in when when that day comes that we do have a, a citywide dark skies ordinance. Um, the, the color stuff, I don't know what to do with. Um, John, I think if, if, how does the current signage programs, or Julia, sorry, how do the current signage programs at the other, at other um, buildings in this area deal with the color stuff? So I, sorry for the delay, but I did finally locate the provisions. So the Sierra Point sign program, which applies to all properties other than the shore, uh, limits palette, uh, color palette to red, blue, green, white, and black. Um, but again, in instances where, as John and Ken referenced, there's a trademarked you know, logo mark, um, even if it may conflict with that palette, that has kind of overridden our um, provisions in the in the Sierra Points and program, but again, it does impose those limitations. Um, and as Ken said, the shore does not impose limitations on on uh, tenants' colors at all. Hmm. Right. Which, which came first? Remind me. Definitely the Sierra Point program. It's from in 1982 yeah. Yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. When it was supposed to be developed as one master campus, was the shore signage program done done by this commission or earlier commissions? I think it was you it guys was, just a yeah. couple of years ago. Twenty nineteen. So we missed that one. Um, does it make sense to 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 echo or or ape the zero point signage program just for to try to return to some consistency? I would not um, recommend that because of the. <laughs> color palette the, that that sign um those that's that those criteria predated that court decision that uh, sort of uh, okay so okay how did um how did how did we deal with the bank of america situation so don do you recall i I have I was, some memory. Um, I, I think Tim Toon, our former senior planner, retired now, was the lead on this. But my recollection was that that they had applied for a replacement sign at the location or approximate location of where their existing sign still remains. And the, the city was asking them to do a number of landscape treatments also in addition to the sign and ultimately they withdrew their application i don't recall that there was an issue with the well actually there might have been two different applications thinking back on it it's a while back so it's it's hard to recall the details and compare those and b of a is a very uh prominent location for the city, and I would say quite sensitive location, given that it's essentially the entrance to central Brisbane. Yeah. So what would happen if, what would happen to your point if there was a request to put a color, a different color than what's allowed right now? So that, that's happened. Um, uh, we, we've had sign review applications come in that propose trademarked, they have to provide evidence that this is their trademarked logo, but essentially it's a logo that contains, you know, purple. And even though that's not an allowed color in the sign program, we cannot tell them you can't use your purple logo. Um, so it's, it's, it's been subject to approval because we can't deny it on that basis. Okay, so then but they have to prove to you that it's trademarked. 
yeah i mean yeah so if there was i mean if if, if we did what doug suggested and have the same color palette it just means that unless it was trademarked they would anyone else would have to sort of abide by the color palette that everyone else in zero point sort of has to do that's true although i would say if there are concerns with certain colors, I know uh, the public member of the public had mentioned red, for example. Red is allowed in the zero point sign program colors. So, like, if you guys didn't want to allow red in a sign, that would be different than um, seems, more right. restrictive. Didn't mean to cut you off. It, it, it seems to me that that um, if we're going to have a the dark skies ordinance coming down the pike and that's going to require the, the dimming of of signage it's not going to matter whether it's red purple chartreuse or puce it's going to get dimmed um so i'm not i'm not sure that we need to, to micromanage the colors of people's signs trademarked or not if the impact of them is going to be affected by the dimming requirements of a dark skies ordinance um, that's again, that's my two cents. Um, anybody else have any, any wisdom on this? Kamala or Alec or Wendy? No. No. Um, in that case, it's probably time for to entertain a motion. Um, my, my suggestion would be a motion along the lines of the earlier ones, which is to approve the resolution with the conditions um, in the proposed resolution with the additional requirement that the um, lighted signage um, be installed with, with timing mechanisms. Um, I think that would be it. Anybody else have any suggestion, uh, any suggested um, other modifications or other uh, criteria? No, sounds good. Can I have a second then, please? I'll second. A voice vote, please, Steph. Commissioner Gooding? Aye. Commissioner Lau? Aye. Commissioner Patel? Aye. Commissioner Saison? Aye. Right. And resolution 2021-SR-9 is adopted as proposed by staff with the additional requirement of uh, timing mechanism uh, being provided in in um, lighted signage um you read the, the appeal procedure anyone may appeal the action of the planning commission to the city council except for specified otherwise appeals shall be filed with a city clerk not later than 15 calendar days following the planning commission's decision exceptions to the 15-day filing period include the following Appeals shall be filed with the city clerk within six calendar days of the planning commission's action for use permits and variances and 10 calendar days for tentative maps and advertising sign applications. An application form and fee is required to make a formal appeal. For additional information, please contact the city clerk at 415-508-2110. All right, I believe that brings us to the last item on our agenda, item H, um, 600 Tunnel Avenue, modification of interim use permit 2022-UP-3, um, the Google buses. Um, staff report, please. Through the, through the yeah. chair, would you like to take a break prior to this? It's up to you, your discretion. Uh, anybody anybody uh, would like one or? No, thanks. I'd like to plow through. All right. Let's plow through then. Um, okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commission. A modification to interim use permit 2021 UP3 is requested by the property owner. That's on behalf of Google to allow for the continued use, use of the site for staging of up to 90 commuter buses. The modification would be to the bus trips. Schedule. Also, before the Commission tonight is consideration of revocation of the use permit for non compliance with one of the conditions 
This was the condition prohibiting bus trips south of the site. By the way, background and ring use permit 2021 EP3 was approved on November 16th of last year. That was a renewal of the interim use permit that was approved for the site in 2019. During the public hearing last November, concerns were raised about certain of Google's operations and whether those complied with the permit. The two operational concerns raised were um, first that the bus movements to and from the site, whether they were in compliance with the schedule provided by Google. And the second was whether some of the buses were using the roadway south of the site instead of all the buses coming and going from the northbound route. A condition of approval was included both in the original approval in 2019 and then in the 2021 renewal, which prohibits bus trips south of the site. And so all trips were required to be to and from the north. There was no such condition regarding hours of operation, but a schedule was provided by Google in their project description. At the time of approval of the renewal, the commission added a condition of approval that Google was to monitor bus movements and provide a report to staff uh, before presentation to the commission after a 90 day, additional 90 days of operation. The report was presented to the Planning Commission on March 10th of this year for the months of November through January, and then a February report has been since added and that was provided in your packet. With regards to the trip south of the site, the reporting for the four month period showed that out of a total of over 8,000 trips, only 14 of them were on the southern route. The most recent report for February showed that out of a total of 2,066 trips, uh, two of those trips were on the southern route. These were attributed to bus training issues or bus driver training issues with the new drivers. And, um, and this rest represents less than one tenth of 1% of the total trips. With regards to the hours of operation, the original use permit application included information outlining the expected hours of operation. However, operational hours were not established, as I mentioned, as conditions of approval. Nevertheless, the bus trip data provided by the applicant showed that the number of, a number of buses were running during midday hours outside the operational hours stated. And Google attributed this change to its employees' needs following the onset of COVID-19. And that was in early 2020. And unfortunately, that uh, schedule did not get up, updated in the November renewal. With this modification request, the applicant has provided that updated schedule now, including um, you know, that revised estimate. Um, the schedule does not show an increase in the number of vehicle trips per day, but it spreads the trips out over a longer period by utilizing midday hours. In essence, the concentration of trips to the early morning and evening hours would be reduced. The applicant has noted that these trip numbers by time of day are intended as an average estimate and request flexibility as Google's needs may change somewhat over time. But the general parameters in, um, between 4 a.m. and 10 p.m. The applicant has not requested a change in the standard of routing buses to and from the north. They noted that the rare instances of buses traveling south, which is attributed to those inadvertent human error issues related to training mostly, um, that they request some degree of flexibility there to address that. Also, I, I should note that road closures could occur as well, which would be outside of, of Google's control and force buses to come or go from the south. For this modification, staff consulted with the city engineer and police department and both responded that they did not have concerns with Google's request. The city engineer noted that some errant buses traveling south of the site are not concerning at, at this kind of scale. 
He also indicated that the buses serve an important function of removing single passenger vehicles from the roadways. And that was uh, noted in the staff report is essentially each, each bus has a capacity of up to 68 uh, individuals, passengers. Um, there are two alternative resolutions before the planning commission tonight as outlined in the agenda report. One is to approve the application based on the original findings, which staff supports and believes this application meets all of those findings. The modification only serves to allow the bus trip to be spread out over the course of the day and would not change the original findings. Conversely, the schedule reflects a reduction in the concentration of trips in the early morning and evening hours, as I mentioned. And so we see that as a positive, actually. The other alternative is denial of modification and adoption of the resolution to revoke the permit. This would be based on non-compliance with the condition prohibiting trips south of the site. As indicated, staff is not supportive of such a zero tolerance approach. Finally, note that the permit is set to expire in eight months. That's in November of this year, unless that ex expiration date is also modified by the commission. Otherwise, it would stay at that date. A decision by the com commission to either approve the requested modification or deny the modification and revoke the permit may be appealed to city council. Approval or denial of the interim use permit is subject to a six day appeal period. Adoption of the resolution revoking the previous approved permit is subject to a 15 day appeal period. So those are two different uh, terms as, as specified in the municipal code and those are detailed in the respective resolutions. So in closing, staff recommends conditional approval of the request modification to interim use permit 2021 UP3, the adoption of the resolution. If you have any questions, I'll take it. Thank you, Ken. Um, commissioners, uh, before we open it up to the applicant, any questions of uh, staff regarding the, the current uh, uh, resolution pro resolutions proposed? Um, Alex. Um, I might have some questions and still sure. thinking. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Sandu. Um, I have a question for Ken. So when the original presentation on this um, permitting happened, there were a lot of different diagrams and, and, and the staff report that you gave. How come that wasn't incorporated into the resolution? Because it seemed as though the ones that we are looking at today, I went through and I tried to make sure that the presentation as, as provided by staff was incorporated into the resolution. You're talking, I think, about the project description. And there's, um, and I touched on this a little bit in the staff report that we have essentially, there's a project description provided by the applicant and certain things might rise to the level of this is something that needs a condition on, but we don't condition necessarily every aspect of, of a project description into conditions of approval. Um, for instance, a, a route map, um, I, I think, as I mentioned, it's, it's, uh, having a zero tolerance on either the having trips outside of the plan schedule or southbound trips. Some of that I think is, is outside of what the applicant control. You have uh, delays on freeways and, and such that, uh, or even road closures that could change that. And then there's human error, which, um, I think has accounted for most, if not all, of what their their south trips have have been. So, um, yeah. I guess was that a choice that was made that you would like? It, okay, this is this is where I'm coming from. We spoke a lot about the timing of the buses 
during the first um, during the first reading of this of this resolution. It seemed to me that there was also a chart that talks about the timing of the buses. Since we talked about it and it was seemed to be a very important part of what we were considering, why wasn't that included? Similarly to how similar to how Jeremiah and um, Julia included their exhibit Ds into what was being approved for the resolution. I don't I don't have an answer for you. I I'd I'd suggest if there's something that the planning commission sees as a condition of approval that you want to have included um, to, to bring that up in the public hearing to include it. But I going back two years and and trying to reconstruct that, I, I guess I I'd suggest that you have this application before you tonight and and it's um well I guess the reason I'm asking is because I think the last time when we were here discussing this, we asked you or the staff to look into doing a fine or figuring out how to cite Google. And um, I guess what you're saying right now is that the timing is not, even though we discussed it at length, um, is not part of the conditions of resolution, um, is not part of the resolution. So you're saying that citation is not an option. So staff consulted with the city engineer about about um, issuing citations and there are, yes, the city could issue citations, um, but issuing citations based on an applicant's own self-reporting, he had concerns about self-incrimination issues there. And I would suggest that the tool really is, is, if this rises to the level of that it's just unacceptable, the, the tool, the better tool is really to revoke the use permit. But you to, mean, to you apply. Mean, you, sorry, Karen, I'm sorry to interrupt just for clarity. Did you mean city, city engineer or city attorney when you were just talking? Did I say engineer? City attorney is who I consulted on, okay, on you. potential citations. Thanks. In, who was the city attorney that you consulted about um, citations? I should correct, Siegel, city legal counsel, Michael Rausch. Okay. And um, what was the authority that he was using that there was um, self-incrimination issues? I didn't ask him for a, a legal citation on that. I was getting his opinion. Okay, because I, I, I think there's three lawyers on here and I know for a fact that corporations don't have the right to to not testify or whatever. We can actually compel them to provide provide data and then use that to convict them in a criminal court. And I'm pretty sure in civil cases, I'm sure Mr. Gooding and Mr. Saison can testify that we can actually call the opposing counsel to the to the stand and have them testify. So I don't understand. And then the other part I don't really understand is as part of our permitting for, let's say, a regular person that's doing something with their house, you require them to open up their house, which is actually a constitutionally protected area, and you require them to allow someone from the city to come into their house and inspect the inside of their house without any sort of worry about any constitutional violation. I'm not sure if you have a question there for me. So my question is, is why would you believe, is it just because the the city attorney told you this or is it, is he didn't, the, there was no reasoning? Through, through the chair, the issue of code enforcement is covered in a separate area of the municipal code. And if you wanna have a discussion about code enforcement process, we can agendize that separately. But I think we're getting off point from this evening's, uh, and we're happy to do that to satisfy the commission's curiosity, but I don't think this particular, as Ken's pointed out, you have options in front of you, which relate to either permitting the use to continue or to not allow the use to continue. And that's what I would humbly suggest the commission focus on this evening. And, and, and I get that, and I get that, but we, we did have a conversation last last meeting about, about um, requesting staff to, 
to consider or, or either propose or agendize or discuss issue, whatever notices of intent to, to cite or are required um, about the, the potential violations by Google. And so I, I think, um, I suspect that's what Commissioner Patel is, is, um, is inquiring about as to what, what our avenues are in that regard that, that, um, that fall somewhere between saying, okay, fine, go ahead, we'll modify or, or revoking, um, which is, you know, per, perhaps somewhat draconian, but, but, um, but there certainly were self-reported violations of, of the use permit on the routing, plus the issue of not having asked for modification of the schedule when, when they were before us only about three or four months ago. <sighs> That's more, more speechifying than it is um, about the, the minutia of, of code enforcement. But I think that's the concern this commission has is that this applicant has um, gone about this process in a rather, um, um, in a less than, than compliant way. Anyway, um, I, I don't wanna speak for, for Commissioner Patel. Did you have any more, any qu more questions to staff, Sandip? No, not at this time. Okay, um, Commissioner Sison, any questions? Yeah, I just I just want to follow up on that. I know we don't want to get off track, but just a quick follow up. So, is staff saying that staff has made a decision not to enforce this with citations, or is that something that the commission could require? Do we have the authority to ask for enforcement? So. The difficulty, I think, is is monitoring these bus trips so that we essentially catch them in in the act, kind of like a a traffic cop catching somebody running a red light. That's that's what they do. They're out there patrolling the roadways. Uh, as planners, we're not out there watching Google. <laughs> um, move in and out of the site and and the citation system is really I, I think set up more as Commissioner Patel indicated um, for building code violations that, and it's really the the citations amounts are not even I, I don't want to call them small they may not be small to some people but they go a hundred dollars then 200 then 500. And generally, after somebody's received a few citations, we we open up other avenues of legal procedures to, to essentially get correction. The idea is to get correction, not to have a punitive um, system in place. Uh, and and so, I think the the tool is is not ideal for this situation. But, it, but, but in this instance, since they were required to self-report and it's, you know, now it's part of their business records and they provided that to us, technically we could cite them. But what, what you're saying is that, mm, you know, we kind of don't want to because it's something that, you know, we, we ask them to provide so that we can have an idea of what's going on. And is, is that it? It's, it's more of policy. We, we don't want to pursue this route. Yeah, I, I think the citing them, I, I'd struggle with how to cite them on past violations that they have self-reported. I, I struggle you know, I, with how to wrap my mind around how we do that under the code. And, I don't think the self-reporting is the issue. That It was clear from, from the application from the get-go that, that they were agreeing to I mean, we don't need a, a cop on the corner when there's a GPS in the bus that reports data. And, and they know that, we know that, and that's what they agreed to provide, and they provided it, and it shows X, Y, and Z. And I, I, I think that the self-incrimination issue is, is, is a red herring, frankly. Um, I, I think the issue is what, what's an appropriate action by us and what's the appropriate mechanism to do it. Um, um, can I ask um, yeah. Ken or staff for... 
from what I recall from last time, but I could be mistaken, that um, wasn't there discussion that the violations were not only the occasional southbound trips, but also the uh, number the number of trips that other times that wasn't originally allotted, you know, or you know, for their use permit, and and are we saying now that that was is it is now actually not a, wasn't a violation with the use agreement because you know I, I from my impression you know i thought that was a that was a violation which could be means for revoking the the use permit so your your memory is correct as as, as mine is on this you all <laughs> Uh, did discuss both the time of day and the southbound trips and were concerned about both. We revisited the code with the city attorney. The code specifically uh, calls for violation of condition of approval. And one item was a condition of approval and the other item was not, although it was part of the project description. So. The thinking was that in terms of revoking the permit, you have the grounds based on the condition of approval with regards to the southbound trip. So if that's the direction that the Planning Commission wants to take, you may take it and you don't need that other, con you don't have that other condition on which to base it. So um, that's how staff worded the resolution and the staff report. Um, if you go the other direction with this, um, then you're essentially a, approving a different schedule where the buses would be more spread out through the day. Oh, well, weren't they in by, I mean, weren't, wasn't the use agreement, the permit for the buses to be traveling during a certain time frame, And then, you know, on their data, their own self-reported data that the, there were a number of buses. I thought I counted like over 700 trips, you know, at times not, you know, within the original agreement. Yeah, I, I think what what kind of saying, if I went and speaking for him, is that <laughs> that 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 piece about the scheduling wasn't for whatever reasons that Mr. Patel already addressed. That wasn't incorporated into the actual conditional use permit. Or excuse me, the use permit um, as part of the conditions of approval. The, the the south route was the schedule the whole the whole scheduling scenario was not um it's what google said they were going to do but then I, they didn't do it i i granted absolutely i don't i don't dispute that at all um i'm just making the okay uh, thank you uh, yeah. <laughs> but those that that's the distinction um uh, uh but your lawyer's dancing on the head of a pin i think is where we're at here but 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 it's the fact that we we have to struggle with that with that piece. Um, any, any other? We should get move on to the applicant pretty soon here. Any other can, uh, excuse me questions of staff? And we'll, we'll we'll comment further later on. But any questions of staff for clarification? Okay. All righty. Um, why don't we then open up the public hearing and uh, begin with the applicant if he has any any further comments to make, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Gooding, Vice Chair Patel. And Commissioners Lau and Saison. My name is Eric Aronson with Baylands Development. I work as part of the operations team responsible for leasing, as well as the development team responsible for sustainability and other matters. Uh, I just want to say Baylands Development recognizes through the actions of this commission the significance of the matter. I want to first thank the commissioners for identifying their concerns while at the same time giving us the opportunity to address those concerns with clear and determined action. Uh, we acknowledge and apologize for the missteps that have occurred over the course of Google tenancy and recognize we have de been delayed at times in our responses and have missed opportunities to communicate certain matters and measures we were taking. The process has taught us important lessons regarding stewardship and what it means to be a good neighbor, both regionally and within Brisbane. Our hope is tonight, what we have provided to staff as part of our modification request in turn, what staff has drafted is resolution 2021 UP3-M can be approved as a modification by this commission and we can continue the use as part of the tenant's regional 
emissions reduction strategy. With that, uh, I would like to give Ross Benson with Google the opportunity to address this planning commission. Uh, members of the city and the public who are joining us and look forward to addressing any questions I can help answer as part of the deliberations tonight. I think Ross is here, yes. Uh, so I'll give it to Ross. Thank, thank you, Eric. And yeah, just, just plus one to everything that you said and, and good evening commission and staff. Um, as Eric said, I'm Ross Benson. I oversee our shuttle operations in the Bay Area. I was actually on the call about a month ago when we previously discussed that. So um, thank you again for the opportunity to be on the agenda tonight and, and chat this through. Um, we're super grateful um, for the partnership that we've had so far, um, and we're, we're hopeful for an opportunity uh, just to kind of re reconsider the scope of our use permit and, and to allow us some additional operational flexibility. Um, I think more important to that, um, as Eric previously mentioned, I, I think we do owe you all, um, the commission staff and the broader community, uh, an apology uh, for kind of how we have handled this process over the last few months, few years. Um, I think the lack of communication and transparency uh, kind of got us to this point today. And I think a lot of it could have been uh, avoided. We spent a lot of time thinking about it and agonizing over what we, you know, we should have done and could have done differently. Um, you know, and, and what we will do differently if we are fortunate enough to extend our permit. And, and I can promise you, uh, we are committed to uh, to doing and, and will do everything in our power uh, to ensure that there are no surprises to the commission uh, going forward and that we are compliant with the terms of the conditions um, of the agreement. So um, again, I, I, I know that it's, uh, <laughs> looking back on this, it, we, you know, we should have never, I think, gotten to this point. And, and I think that it's a lot of that is self-inflicted. So um, apologies for that. And apologies for like this probably taking more time um, than, it, than it really should have. So, um, you know, with that, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have of us about the operation or, you know, how we can uh, make this better going forward. So, thanks again. Thank you very much. Um, commissioners, any questions of, of either of uh, these two gentlemen? Um, yes, can may I ask a question to Ross? Yeah. Um, with the uh, anticipated, or it's probably unclear, it's already started the return to work, what the uh, projection on the volume of trips um, that are going to be, you know, upcoming in the next few months plus. Yeah, so I, th I think the the maximum capacity that we're restricted to in the, at the site is 90 buses. So in theory, we would expect the maximum number of trips to be about 180. So that's, you know, 90 buses going out in the morning, 90 buses returning in the afternoon. Um, there are some situations where a bus actually, like for our San Bruno location, for example, um, a bus will leave in the morning to, you know, service that location, actually park at Brisbane during the midday. So um, in, in theory, that 180 could be maybe 184 or something like that, because we have a handful of buses that do that do park there in the midday. But um, yeah, that, that 180 is, is kind of the target max capacity. So the buses are usually just do one round trip. They don't do multiple trips. No, so they do, but the, the vast, vast majority of the buses, they'll, they'll leave Brisbane in the morning, go do their the morning service, and then they actually park in, during the midday uh, down in Mountain View at Moffat Field. And then from there, they, you know, they park in the midday, then they'll do their, their evening pickup at Sunnyvale or Mountain View, head, head north, uh, and then park in the lot over. And what are, like, um, you know, the, are there typical hours of operation at Google? Yeah. So, Business um, hours. <laughs> yeah, and I think we in, in the some of the the data that has shared, and I don't know if you guys saw the the February data that we shared over. So that is pretty. I mean, that's reflective of of what the you know what the schedule, the the majority of the schedules are going to look like with those with those time windows. Um, and I don't I don't have that in front of me right now, but that I yeah, think the majority of is over five six o'clock, you know, in the evening returning, and then the six to eight in the morning. Six yeah, to seven in the morning. Yeah, approximately. Like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, generally, I mean, people. I mean, we're starting to see some of these new data points come in now. Uh, we we do expect people's time in the office to uh, potentially change because of, of you know there's a COVID dynamic. Um, and you know, our our original operating assumption going into this, you know, our return to office was that people would probably start coming in a little bit later and maybe and probably even leaving a little bit early. 
uh, earlier than, than they did pre-COVID. We haven't gotten a ton of data on that just yet, but we expect to have some of that, uh, a clearer picture on what that, those new trends look like or stuff. So you, but um, as a company, do you have any projected of like um, percentage-wise of people that you know, will be going back to returning to the office? Or what's the, yeah, so, you know, yeah, what's the ad amount? Yeah, so the expectation is that uh, that you're in the office uh, three days a week. So that and that there's flexibility baked into that as to what which three days we don't describe. Um, that has to be you know Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, that, that's up to individual teams. And currently, what do you know? What percentage of people have been going to work versus you know staying at home? Yeah, so the the, the mandatory return to office, the, the three day week, that actually started on April fourth. So we're um, about two weeks into into our our company, our, our Bay Area uh, RTO. Our but like uh, like like two months ago or three months ago, do you know what the percentage of the uh, employees were, you know, going into the office? Unique uh, visit, so like you know. Somebody going into the office at least once a week was fairly high, and, and I, I think we can get these numbers and share them. I don't have them in front of me, but that was probably about 80%. But that number dropped off pretty significantly for if, you, if your people were going in more than uh, once per week. So, yeah, a, a, sm a small number, but we've seen a, a significant increase um, since that, that April 4th date that I mentioned. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, Commissioner Patel, any questions of either applicant or either? Uh, no. Thank you. Commissioner Sayasan. Yes, I have a question. Um, so, Mr. Benson, so the problem that I have here is in your initial um, operational you know, um, plan, um, no buses were to leave the lot after 7 a.m. And I remember that first meeting we had in 2019 where we discussed it. I mean, I know it was not put in the conditions of approval, but a lot of the discussions were were about traffic and safety and that, wow, what a great idea that you were not leaving after seven because after seven, there's more traffic, there's more bicyclists on the road. Um, you've got your neighbor, Golden State Lumber, who had an employee come and speak to us that said, you know, they're really busy up until 11 a.m. and um, you know, they get customers that come in starting at 6 a.m. So, you know, so it, so we kind of felt that if if we, you know, if you guys didn't leave after seven, it would help with the, you know, the traffic flow and the safety issues and whatnot. And you wouldn't start coming back until later on in the afternoon, three or 4 p.m. So by containing you guys within those two, you know, separate um, hours of operation, it was deemed better just just for just safety and you know whatnot, and so and, and so my my concern is that you've you've now you're now proposing to have movement all throughout the day, and we don't know what that looks like because we previously agreed that the way you had it before was better for traffic and safety, and you know and 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 I'm surprised that you've proposed this modification without providing us any data to assure us that your new movement, you know, won't pose, you know, a negative impact. I mean, we somewhat discussed this at the initial hearing where one of our commissioners asked if you have the ability to kind of mo uh, monitor traffic flow in the immediate area or down Beatty. And actually our former commissioner, um, Napolo Gomez actually asked you that question. And um, your response to him was, quote, it's a relatively simple way to do it is we can kind of do spot checks. We would be more than willing to probably pay for a consultant or just go and sit at the gate and monitor the flow over like the course of a week. And we can do that several times over a year or whatever kind of frequency that we can agree on. And you then stated that you did something like that similarly in the South Bay. So my question is, you know, it was about a month and a half ago since we had our meeting and you knew we were gonna have this hearing. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering why during that month and a half time, you didn't do something like that so that we can have the data. Okay, this is what you've been doing for the past month and a half. 
why not monitor the traffic flow like you said that you could have done and we could have had that data to say, okay, look, it, this looks like it could work. It, yeah, it at so least would show us, yeah. Sorry, was, go ahead, sorry. No, I'm just, I'm just saying it would at least show us that you're more serious about trying to make this work. And I'm just a little bit disappointed by the lack of data. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I will say that we are very serious about making this work and we want to do, we want to provide whatever information that we can. Um, I think the, with the data that we have provided on the bus trip for February, um, will show what, you know, what's going on in those, those off hours that you're describing. And I think at the, I think any traffic engineer will say that that's a relatively insignificant number of trips um, through that through that corridor and through those intersections. Um, and, and I think we, you know, can, that is something that Ken uh, and team did raise with, you know, with PD and the, and the traffic engineering team on, on with the city. Um, I think with the other point about the traffic study, which you're describing, that I mean, that is a relatively uh, simple thing to do. I think the I, the one question that I would just um, have back to you is what. What is the problem that we're looking to, to solve? Right? Do we just do we just need to know what the number of trips, like car trips, are going through an intersection in a period of time? Um, and if so, what like what is the threshold? Like, do we, you know, what what is, you know, what? what well, I what kind of we... well, yes. I mean, I I like to know now if now that you're now moving all throughout the day in and out of that lot. I'd like to know what kind of impact that is having in terms of, of traffic and and because you have other neighbors there besides Golden State Lumber, you know, the car rental place, whatnot. So this new change of operation by you, you know, what's I'd, I'd like to just have some idea what's 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 going on out there. But right now we, we have nothing. I mean, we, we agreed before the other the other way worked, you know, was going to work out well and you know now we have something new and we have nothing to to go by on that you know yeah agreed so I, again I, I mean i think a commission or a, um, a traffic study i mean there's tons of third-party consultants that do these um you know if we i think we would be more than happy to look into doing that um to, to evaluate that what the impact is I, I would just add too that because of the the, the force direction of using northbound tunnel um, instead of using it, you know, bi-directional, uh, that, that will impact that too. So, um, but regardless, I think we're, you know, we're open to looking into that um, or, uh, you know, any other measures that the, the. And what, one more question where, you know, your explanation for why buses are still going southbound occasionally is because of a training issue. And so my, my question with that is what, what actually are, are is 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 a training that you think needs to be done? I don't understand why a bus driver can't just not go south. I mean, what? I mean, is it? it... I, I I am equally frustrated by this. I, I um yes, I I agree with you. I think the uh, you know, with thousands of trips per month, there there you know, human error is just going to be a thing, right? And I think we we had less than one percent um of you know non-compliance on the routing. Uh, with the most recent report that we sent over um so i i think it's hard to guarantee a hundred percent of anything um but we will work and we continue to work with our vendor teams to to, to, to get to that hundred percent but um yeah it, it, I, I i share your frustration on that one it's something that we spend a lot of time in our vendor meetings and, and talking to them about um and we will we will continue to do so so commissioner Sias, on what 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 sort of traffic Traffic study would would you be interested in seeing to, to give us more data? Well, if well, if we grant it, I mean, I would like to um, have them as what they previously suggested they could do is is hire an independent consultant and monitor. I mean, ideally, I think the best way is to actually have a security camera that that you could see the traffic so that we could actually look what's going on at this time of day or this. I mean, you know, so that we can actually see for ourselves and look at what's going on, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think actually a camera would, would, be, would work better, but an independent consultant, I guess that could be another option. And Commissioner, we, we could actually, I mean, we could set up a camera. I mean, that, there, that's, that's something that's pretty straightforward to do um, and we give you guys the link. I mean, I think then the challenge becomes like, you know, how do you, you know, who's gonna be watching this thing, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's certainly, 
an option that we can explore them as well. Okay, I mean, if, yes. So it, 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 let's say, let's say if we grant modification, okay, so you're not opposed to putting a camera with a link like that we can automatically look at, or you're saying the city can link? Yeah, I th so I, I mean, I have to look at this. So we, we have similar situations where we have, there's like, it's basically like a solar powered camera with, with a, like a SIM, cellular SIM card. Um, that can just run 24 seven and that we, whoever has access to the account can view it. Uh, and then we, we can actually go back and look at historical footage too for some period of time. I don't think it's a significant amount, but yeah, that, that's something that we could probably have up and running I mean, tomorrow or Monday even. Okay. Um, any other questions from commissioners before we open it up to the public? No? All righty. Let's open it up to the public then. Um, staff. And we have what a time window of how long? A minute? I don't remember. Um, this is Michelle Salmon. I've sat through this several times now. I'm, um, I think that BDI has worked really hard to meet all of the requirements that they're responsible for, and their partner is falling short. Um, but one of the issues that I asked for twice now is that the bollards be removed from Tunnel Road. Um, with the addition of the Google buses and the increased traffic with the Google buses and the and the Google cars associated with those buses, that's like 400 trips a day. Um, those bollards are a real threat to public safety because if a bus comes out and you don't, you know, doesn't see you, and you don't have time to stop and you end up running into the bollards. I think they need to be removed. They're not safe. As long as we have the Google bus lot there, those bollards are not safe for people driving on Tunnel Road. And when you look at the number of tra traffic um, trips, 90 buses times two or times three, plus 90 cars for the drivers that leave their cars there. So they come in, park their car, take their bus, and then they leave too. So that's, that's like 400 trips a day in and out of the Google lot. And you talk about setting up a camera or setting up this or setting up that, but there's already technology that would allow you to monitor every single bus and car trip. And that's called something similar to faster. And each bus should have its own um, scanner and each uh, employee car should have its own scanner so that you can track the trips and whether they go in or out or what time they go in and out. And also whether they go southbound or come from southbound you can have a monitor on the highway that would uh, on the tunnel road that would register that. So I think this is solvable and uh, Google just needs to make a commitment to do what needs to be done and stop putting BDI in the crossfire uh, when they're trying to help you and uh, also resolve the issues that they have uh, with the city of Brisbane. And so my ask is that A, you remove the bollards and that is on BDI. And B, that you set up a reasonable system for tracking every single vehicle that goes in and out of that parking lot and which direction they go. Let's review the data in two months and, you know, then decide, because it's going to get reviewed in eight months, whether we extend your permit or not. I'm sure you want a longer permit than eight months. So Google is like the genius when it comes to data and everything else. This should not be rocket science. It should not be rocket science. I'm concerned for the safety and the traffic of the people of Brisbane and the people who travel on Tunnel Road and your own drivers. And they speed, by the way. So maybe you can put a second one out there, uh, you know, on the northern end at Beatty so you can see how fast they're going down Tunnel Road. Um, so safety is my big concern. Thank you so much. And Commission, thank you for asking the tough questions. You know, the timing of the buses should have been a condition of approval, and I'm disappointed that that wasn't written into the permitting process like it should have been and like we all expected it to be. 
but um, thank you for your attention to that. Thank you, Michelle. Any other uh, public comments? Uh, staff, has our timer run on public comments yet? Oh, Hi, Mary, we can hear you. Oh, geez. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Good evening. Um, so I'm not going to be, I've been following this since the beginning, and safety is key on tunnel. Tunnel is just not wide enough. And that's something we can't change. So we're we're um, contemplating more trips all day long up and down tunnel, and it's, it's just not gonna work. But anyway, I would just like to recap because um, I think we all need to hear this. October 19, um, Google came forward requesting um, a use permit for this parking lot. Um, it was um, requested for five years. They were given a two year uh, period with some conditions, uh, lighting, dust mitigation, and uh, routing of the, the buses. We needed some traffic circulation and trip, trip data. The lighting, I think it has been addressed. We still have a dust issue. I've heard people complain about that. Maybe not in writing, but it, it does get dusty down there. And of course, the trip data, which is self-reported. Self-reported. We should be getting this data from an independent contractor, independent company, because we have no, we can't go back and audit that data. They can, they can fudge it, just like with the number of trips. Although I do have to give it to them that they self-reported their violations. Even though that permit was, um, the time slots were not indicated on the approval of that permit, it was verbally agreed to at that first meeting. I remember that. You can go back and listen to it. Two years later, the lease expires. That trip data was required. That was part of that use permit. We had to ask for that data. They did not come forth with any type of data. So violation of the use permit in, since the start 2019, violation of the permit in 2021. November 2021, they came forth with their self-reported data and um, we uh, granted them an, an interim permit for one year, right? March 22, we continue with violations. Bus, buses are going down south instead of going uh, north. I don't know about you guys, but I don't have any confidence in them complying with the use permit because they haven't. They've been, they, have, they haven't complied. They've been in violation the whole time. So I don't know why we think they're gonna continue, they, they will be complying with that use permit. Um, it's lack of compliance, lack of transparency. But one thing they've been consistent with, their behavior to beg for forgiveness rather than ask for permission. I think that commission has been very flexible with letting them um, a little more time, we'll get the data, a little more time, we'll fix the lighting, a little more time, we'll fix the dust. It's empty promises. Um, and I just don't see um, them complying. If we choose to grant them um, this use permit, I, I just don't see them complying. But I really do, we should really think about Tunnel Avenue is just not made for those type of, that many trips, of all those buses going back and forth, back and forth. It's not safe, as uh, Michelle mentioned, the bicyclists, there's nowhere, there's nowhere to pull over. For cars, there's nowhere to pull over because of those bollards. And I remember, um, I can't remember his name um, from BDI, but he wasn't ready to move those bollards because of um, folks throwing trash over the side there. So I think the bollards are there to stay, but we should try and get them to remove them. Um, 
anyway, so that's that's my um, opinion. I hope that uh, the commissioners really think about this because we're setting precedents, right? Um, it's you know this. I think this will be their third strike, um, and I think we really need to think about this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Uh, Staff, are there any other uh, public hands raised? Yes, we have Randall. Hi, uh, Randall, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to, to let me speak on this. I've kind of been following this. Uh, as a Brisbane resident, I travel that corridor. And the one thing I, I, I can say that be it private or public uh, uh, buses, I mean, it's a necessity for, for transportation, multiple people be it on Tunnel Avenue, be it on Obey Shore. Uh, what I do like hearing is that uh, in listening, I mean, realistically, nothing's 100%. Uh, human error, people make mistakes, drivers make mistakes. Uh, I drive a lot and I make mistakes all the time. But, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to accept that, take ownership of that. And I, I'm, I'm happy to see that the commission is listening and everybody's looking for a solution because that's really when it comes down to, down to it that's all we have is finding a solution to make this work because we need to get people from one point to another so they get to work so our society and our community can get back to work well so that's all i have to say on it and i appreciate your time thank you thank you um staff any other hands raised looks like michelle has her hand raised again Go ahead, Michelle. I just want to set the record straight. I think that the dust and the majority of the dust now is coming from Golden State Lumber because EDI did address the dust issue. They did address the light issue. I want this to work out because environmentally, you know, the Google buses are not a bad thing. I am concerned about safety. We need to remove the bollards, and if there's garbage, pick it up. People are dumping garbage there anyway. At least then there's a little bit more safety involved there's a place to ditch if you need to i think that's key to making this happen and i think that google needs to hold up their end and support bdi's uh support of you google and in and put the things in place that we can monitor what's happening and you train your drivers not to speed they'll get a fine if they speed they'll get a fine if they go south you know i mean make it hurt their pocketbooks they're the drivers it's human error it happened, but you know you are their uh, employer, or you know oversee this program, and so I think it's up to Google to enforce it, um, because Brisbane's trying really hard to make it work, and BDI is trying really hard to make it work, and Google, you say you're trying really hard to make it work, so don't just say do, please, so that we can not have to go through this again. And uh, if we want limited hours of operations for Spain, then we should put that in the uh, permit. If we want to limit the number of trips, we should put that in the permit. We should not just assume because we talked about it, that it's going to happen, obviously. The, so that's all I have to say. But, you know, we've been trying, BDI has been trying, Google, you need to try harder and come up to snuff. I expect more from you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have we run through the time period by now? Yes, we have, and there are no more hands raised. All righty. May I have a motion to close the public hearing, please? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Yeah. Voice vote, please. Commissioner Gooding? Aye. Commissioner Lau? Aye. Commissioner Patel? Aye. Commissioner Saison? Aye. Right, the public hearing is closed. Thank you all for comments. Um, commissioners, any any further comments or deliberations? Is it too late to ask a, um, Mr. Benson a, another question no. regarding the data? No, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to, if you can interpret this data for me, like let's say on a certain day, there's like the six, at six o'clock, you know, 10, the number 10, is that 10 is, you know, that that's 10 buses that have left during that time frame. I just want to, and are yeah. we assuming that at the, at the beginning of the day at five o'clock or 459, um, 
is there probably 90 buses on the on the property you know the start off with every day there hasn't been we just started the, the data that you're looking at i'm assuming is probably for february yes yes okay yeah so that um there would have been around f approximately 50 buses parking there in february uh okay with our with our return to office now in april uh we're going to see a, closer to that uh, that 90 max capacity so like right now like on like today what would you say like that number normally would be, you know, how many buses are in that lot at 459? I mean, I have to double check, but I think to, like today we probably had uh, 80, mid eighties. Okay. Cause I'm just curious because today, uh, today happened to be out there at 930 and I counted the number of buses in the lot and there were six. And so that means that, there would have been what 84 80 plus buses that have left in that time frame but you know in in some of these numbers there that i see in january february there's you know it doesn't come even close to you know that amount there <laughs> right you know, yeah, like from, just... from from five o'clock to like eight o'clock it's uh, about 24 uh, about 30 bus you know 30 trips you know in that time frame so that um, so that that was in February, you know. Uh, uh, that, that that's why I just wanted some clarification of that of that data. Yeah. So your RTO program just started in in early April, right? Correct. Yeah. April. Yeah. April fourth. All right. Uh, neither. Um, thank you. Thank you. Any any comments? Deliberations? I would just say um, the following. I think that when we first took this up. Um, the everybody agreed um that having buses transport people from san francisco down to the peninsula was a good idea all of so i don't think anyone i don't think anyone disagreed with that that concept but i don't think that's the question that's before us today that's not actually the question the question before us today is there was a use permit that was granted the company violated it numerous times and the and whether or not we're going to revoke that permit and the problem the reason why that is the question is because there are a lot of other companies that are that have used permits and if we say hey we know that google violated the light they said that the light um they knew that it was too bright they got complaints but they didn't do it until six months later because they just didn't get around to it they violated the trips that they said they were going to to restrict and they didn't they didn't restrict those trips they went southbound they they had more trips than they said they were going to so there's a numerous there's numerous times where they've said something and they didn't do it and so are we basically saying hey yeah we'll let everybody have 5 10 20 turns to violate the use permit with no repercussions. At that point, there is no use permit. There's no check on, on what companies can do um, if there's no repercussions for what they've already done. Okay, um, Commissioner Sayasan, any comment? Yeah, and that's that's my main um, concern about that too. It It, it does bother me the the precedents that we're that we're setting here it's you know we have rules and i think we've been really understanding uh with with google and you know but these violations keep on happening and and even you know now as we were talking about okay could they hire an independent consultant to monitor you know what the um you know what what what, what the traffic is like you know or put a security camera there so that we can see what's going on, the buses interaction with possibly bicyclists or other vehicles, you know, just for safety issues. Um, if they had come today and even on their own suggested that or, or did it during the month and a half while we were waiting for this next meeting, you know, I, 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 I might, you know, think, oh, okay, you know, let's, let's give them this extra chance. But I feel as though, there is not that initiative by them. They're, they're, I just don't feel like they're taking it as seriously 
sure, they're, they're serious when they're before us and when we're asking for things. But why didn't they think of that themselves? I mean, what, you know, and, and, that's, and that's my concern because not only has there been a history of violations, but then I, it would be nice if I felt like they really appreciated that and, and really tried to make the effort and took that initiative. And I just feel like I'm not seeing it and I'm already anticipating even by what they're proposing, like, you know, um, be flexible with us. You know, there's gonna be human error. So I feel like they're already preparing us for bus drivers going south again. And the problem with that is, again, with the mention about the bowlers, I mean, there's, you know, if they go south, there's, there's more, I think, possibly pedestrian traffic or bicyclists down there. I think it's, it's much more dangerous. There's a reason why we say don't go south. But I feel like that's going to happen. You know, it, it might not happen a lot, but it will. You know, I feel like, and, and so, you know, it, it raises just that little safety concern that who knows, you know, it could be the one accident that happens because, you know, they went south, you know. So that's why I, I felt like, you know, I, I just wanted more, more data, more something so I can make a, an educated um, decision here. But I just feel like we, we, we don't have it. You know, I mean, it's something that they're now offering to provide us more data, but I feel like that should have happened already. You know, it's, it's an, it, it, we keep on delaying things, trying to get the information. So, so I'm, you know, I'm. Do you think, do you think it would be uh, worthwhile to, to uh, people this matter, this matter for a brief period of time to get more data from Google about the, the traffic impact of the, the uh, expanded schedule? I personally don't because they've already told us at their last at the last hearing that they're going to do what's best for Google. Because when we said, like, look, you're in violation of all of these things that you said you were going to do, and I specifically asked, so are you going to stop doing them? And the answer was no, because they can't. So the problem, there's two problems really that I think um, Commissioner Sayasan touched on. One is the fact that they have been non-compliant and are we going to just continue to let non-compliant people become, be non-compliant? The two is there's no, I don't think that anybody here can have an honest faith belief that they're going to do what they're saying, what they're going to, what, what they say they're going to do because they haven't over the course of the last two years. One of the issues I have with this is that, that um, for reasons we, we've already hashed, um, the, the trip scheduling was not a condition of the permit. And, and I think I, I own that as much as anybody else that I didn't really spot that the, that, that issue wasn't a condition um, made part of the original use permit. Um, but as it, this may just be a, be a technical matter, but but we're a technical commission enforcing, you know, technical requirements. Um, I don't think we can call it a, a, a legal violation of the use permit to have expanded the trip scheduling um, beyond what was originally contemplated by all. No argument about that. What we can enforce is violations of the of the routing, um, which which by their self-reporting, you know, is, is, is there in the data. Um, and I would like to explore personally, I would like to explore that, that possibility of, of citations for those violations, um, um, which I, I thought we had expressed earlier at our last meeting was, was one of our interests. Um, but that's, that's my two cents worth. Um, Alex, anything further or anybody else anything further? No, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, from what I hear, it's like the time of use for the permit is actually not a violation since it wasn't included in the use permit. So the only violations that have, uh, I guess, technically or legally uh, occurred or is the um, southbound trips, uh, which I still kind of find comical of why they occur. They're not using Google Maps or maybe they're using Apple Maps. 
or something. Anyways, um, um, and but I do have concerns about the data, um, about the self-reported data because it, I don't know if it, it just maybe it just doesn't make sense to me. And and um, because of that data, you know, I have concerns with the amount of the, with the volume of uh, safety issues. You know, um, I I used I used to go down tunnel, you know, at that hours and it, you know, with the, there's a lot of traffic around Golden State, you know, early in the morning with the contractors and heavy equipment and forklifts, you know, crossing that street there, as well as that other lot, whatever I feel is maybe a city and county of San Francisco or something, you use that lot or a, part, or a bus, um, some company, you know, a lot of people park their cars there. There's, you know, there's traffic on there. Um, the, you know, concerns about the, about the safety issues, but going back to, you know, your point, you know, the only things would be the violations of the southbound. And I don't know if that's enough to revoke the permit or just to issue citations. I don't think we can issue a citation is what they're saying is the only avenue is what staff is saying. The only avenue of redress is the revoking the permit. And I would say this is even though the time and number of buses leaving um, wasn't included for whatever reason in the original um, resolution that was discussed for a very long time. And we had assurances from both BDI and Google that those were going to be the times. And so it wasn't, it wasn't like out of the blue that we're like, hey, wait, actually you said it was going to be this time. It was discussed. So fine, it can't be the technical reason why the permit is revoked, even though it was discussed and agreed upon and it's recorded. Um, the fact is, we really have a situation where we have a company, it could be any company, let's say it's, let's say it's a biotech company and there are conditional, there's conditional permit was given, they violated that permit. And the question is, is do we revoke or do we not? And if we don't revoke, do we do that for everyone else that comes after, after this? And the answer has to be no. Like there has to be some, we have to be able to enforce the conditional permits that we are approving. And, and, and I would add to that, I mean, let's say if we were to revoke, it doesn't mean we're removing Google buses from the streets. Um, I'm sure Google could find an alternative site. You know, so it's, it, you know, it's, it's not that, you know, we're, we're now putting all these cars, you know, on, 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 on the street, I'm sure, you know, so it's Brisbane, it's not the only, you know, location for them. And I, and, and I think, you know, pretty much, you know, at all times, I don't think this was an ideal location. I mean, it's just, I mean, it was, you know, I, I was always somewhat skeptical, but I was willing to give it a, a, a chance. And that's why I initially voted in, in favor of it, but it's just, with all these problems and with all this, just the inability to kind of rely on, you know, what, what they're telling us, you know, I mean, and especially the, the whole hours of operation, I'm sorry, you know, it was an oversight on our part to not put it in there because it was understood what the hours of operation for what was and the fact that it benefited safety. I mean, it was a, one of the reasons I used to grant the initial permit. They had a charge. They showed us a chart where, when the buses were moving. We relied on that chart. What was the point of putting in a chart if it was just a suggestion? I mean, it, we all knew that they were, that's what, how they were supposed to operate. So, you know, um, so, you know, I'm, it's to, to say that that was something they didn't have to comply with. I, I, I think, I think we're just kind of kidding ourselves. I mean, we all knew that that's how they were supposed to operate. So, um, yeah, so um, I I just don't think this is an ideal location, and and you know I would hope that prior to this meeting that Google has been looking for an alternative site because I I, I think you know um, their buses are 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 benefit to to the commuter uh, to the community at broad abroad and you know and we should have them out there, but I don't think I don't think our location is is the best location for it. Hmm. 
So it, it seems it, like if you, you were going to revoke the permit, mm -hmm. that, is that like effective immediately? Is there like a some um, you know like some thirty day notice? Well, I or think they probably like have an opportunity to appeal it and then mm -hmm. and then. That's that's correct. It's in the resolutions on the appeal period, whether you were to approve or revoke or appeal periods um, associated with each. So they have 15 days to appeal a revocation. And that, appeal, and a, uh, that appeal goes to the city council? Correct. And if that's finalized by city council, is there a a uh, time period where if they wanted to apply for a new permit with like if a year the revocation was was upheld yeah. by city council i believe they'd have to wait a year to apply for a new permit i i'm i'm still struggling with the fact that that uh, I, I'm not sure I I understand or or fully uh, accept. I guess the fact that we don't have uh, citation authority or powers um, under this use permit. Um, this it, just for a point of clarification. So if you did, you would want Google find for these whatever the seven incidents or fifteen incidents of southbound trips is that the commission's desire and that would put you on a different path separate from revocation or do you want it's, revocation it's, and for the city to pursue enforcement what do, when we can certainly you know we can refer this to the city attorney I have a problem with you know referring your suggestion or request or recommendation to the city attorney i was not sure how it's material to your decision making tonight well, I know I, I, that's a that's a good question. The, the question was was mine and not not the commission's as a whole, um, because I, you know, I have my own opinions as to what what our best course of action would be. But I'm just one of one of four, and not, not even one of five tonight. Um, I, I, I had yeah, some I, some. Go ahead, Alex. I know I had some some of the thoughts like you know if if. You know, if there was a uh, some type of penalty, and then to, you know, would and th would that allow them to, can, to still, you know, um, you use the permit till it expires in November, so seven months, and um, and then, you know, maybe have, maybe be reassessed at that time, or prior to that time, they were going to reapply. I guess ultimately, though, um, whatever action we do, let's say we revoke, then that'll go to the city council. The city council could be like, you know what, we just want to assess a fine and then have staff do an assessment on how to do a fine. I don't know if we just keep kicking the can and continuing this conversation. Um, I think that to your point, Doug, my recollection is that the recommendation last time was for citations, but the answer was that we need to either revoke or approve this new amended um, resolution, which basically, <laughs> which basically doesn't address any of the issues that we've been we've been concerned with. So, I would say I would probably make a mo when we're done discussing this. I would make a motion to revoke. Can I ask Steph one, one quick question regarding the bullards? I remember when this issue came up before, you stated that that's something the city council has to deal with, correct? That's correct. So there's nothing we could do about it. I mean, you know, because they're, because it's that's, not, because it, it, not, in terms of safety, I'm, I'm you know, let's. It's not, it's not the opinion of the city engineer that those bollards, that this, business operation is affected by the presence of those bollards. That's the city engineer's opinion from a safety standpoint. But was the city engineer factoring in that 
because he was going by the fact that they were only going northbound, but was he considering if the Google buses were going southbound, that that would pose an issue? The, the, the six trips or whatever the number was, yes, I believe he, that he saw that data as well. That data was shared with, he's aware of the southbound trips. But that's also, I mean, we're, but we're relying on the fact that, I mean, we don't know what the bus drivers will do. I mean, okay, some, some months it was two, some months it was six, some, I mean, I mean, again, there's real no control over that. So, um, you know, it, it could be a dozen trips a month. I mean, we don't, we don't know. So we have to assess if some buses do go south and let's say if there are a lot, would that pose a safety risk with those bollards there? I mean, okay, it's just, it's just another thing like we, we don't have answers to and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, I think, if I interpret John correctly, that, that the, the ballers are, are, are a, a street and traffic issue that's under the jurisdiction of the city council and not of the planning commission that, that rules on, on permits right. and, and land use issues. Is that, that, that's correct. They were installed for a separate agreement between BDI and, and, and the city. Yeah, okay. Yes, but with us knowing that sometime, and, and who knows when in the future, how many buses will be going south, you know, so we know that that may happen. And let's say bicyclists are there or, or whatnot, you know, we, that's something we have to factor in. That's, that's something that, that could happen. That's, you know, so um, we can, the, the bullets are there. We can't remove them. So we have to vote based upon knowing that they're there. Are we going to rule in favor of them continuing with their use, knowing that, Occasionally, we don't know how how many times the buses will go south. You know, so yeah. All right, I think we're done with the discussion. Um, are we? Any further discussion? I don't want to cut anybody down. No. Um. We have a motion. I I was I think I said I was going to make a motion to revoke the permit, and that would involve adopting the. Well, let's be real clear about this: the the proposed alternative of revocation of the motion, uh, pardon me, of the permit uh, that was proposed by staff cites uh, as the findings in support of that. Um, let me get it up here. Um, violating condition of approval number four uh, about the routing of the tunnels, me, routing of the buses um, southbound um, instead of northbound as required by the use permit. Um, and that is the only finding upon which the proposed revocation is, is stated. Um, is, that, is that the motion that you're making? Yes. For the chair, I I just add I I think along with that the the motion should be to deny the modification. So you're both denying the modification and you're then adopting the resolution to revoke if that's how the commission goes. That's that's right. That's the motion. Okay, I'll I'll second it. All right, voice vote, please. Commissioner Gooding? No. Commissioner Lau? Aye. Commissioner Patel? Aye. Commissioner Saison? Aye. All right. Um, vote being three to one, the motion carries. Um, and the commission will adopt the um, Proposed the proposed resolution as attachment, which was attachment B uh, to the agenda materials, um, with the findings um, stated therein. Um, Let me read the appeal process. Um, if I read through the chair, it might yeah. be cleaner if I read it directly off the resolution. Um, yeah, absolutely, go right ahead. So for the 
revocation, the effective date for this decision is April 30th, 2022, unless an appeal is filed to city council by close of business on April 29th, in accordance with the procedures provided in Brisbane Municipal Code section 17.52.020, and then the other one, roll up to this one, for the modification, the denial of the modification of the interim use permit, um, the effective date for this decision is April 22nd, so a different date. April 22nd, 2022, unless an appeal is filed to city council by close of business on April 21st of 2022. Very good, thank you very much, Kim. Um, all right, I believe that concludes the items of new business. Thank you to all the members of the public who commented. And thank you, uh, applicants, for your time. Um, that concludes our items of new business. Um, staff, are there any um, study sessions or workshops to discuss or warn us about? <laughs> On your unmute. My apologies. Uh, no, I mean, you will be getting into some housing element workshops and hearings later in the spring. But I don't have the dates in front of me for those, but that process is continuing. But that's all I had. Okay, thank I'll, you. I'll just add to that. We're looking at uh, probably a hearing in the second meeting of May and probably sometime close to that also a might be a special meeting as well but we'll we'll explore that further with you all okay thank you uh, any other items initiated by staff other than that any items initiated by the commission oh, i have two things i think one i would ask the staff to agendize the enforcement training that that was suggested um, and if possible, I'd like the um, city attorney to provide the authority that there's self-incrimination rights. Um, and then the second thing would be is to maybe agendize um, what exactly gets incorporated into resolutions because it would be, I think, my suggestion that whenever there is an agenda packet that is provided to the commission that it be incorporated into the resolution. Okay, we'll agendize that. Right, any other items initiated by any commissioner? In that case, uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. Long night. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank Thanks for showing up, Alex. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>